Awesome. Okay, cool. So now we come back, we reset, and we are continuing the Tiaki Protect theme. Now, this session includes two videos, a keynote and a panel discussion as well. So first of all, we're going to watch a video with the late Sir Rob Fenwick, who left us too early. Kāro hara, moi mai rā e te rangatira. That was a little over four years ago, and we asked him to look into the year 2050 and what success a predator-free 2050 could look like. And that will be followed by an update from his daughter, Izzy, as well. But Rob, if you don't know, was an environmental entrepreneur who demonstrated that business can put conservation at the centre of business practice. He co-founded the National Organic Composting Business Living Earth Limited and was the owner of the Matsuku Oyster Farm. His conservation leadership roles included the Predator Free 2050 movement and working to save the Kiwi from extinction. For Crazy and Ambitious 2, BioHeritage asked Sir Rob Fenwick to stand in the future and describe what 2050 looks like and what has happened to achieve success. In this video, he travels into the future to take us on a virtual trip of the Coromandel to show us how powerful community conservation can be when it clusters around a single cause. The late Sir Rob Fenwick, what success will look like. It's a summer's day in year 2050, and it's really warm. I'm in Auckland's downtown, about to leave by high-speed ferry for Coromandel to visit the world-famous Maui Hau Native Bird Sanctuary. It's a 1,500 square kilometre area that stretches from Fletcher Bay in the north to 80 kilometres south to its narrowest point between Whangamata and Thames. It's famous because the entire peninsula is a forest and coastline sanctuary where New Zealand's indigenous bird life is flourishing in abundance. And it's been made possible by a program that was launched more than 30 years ago to the amazement of the rest of the world to rid the whole country of introduced mammalian predators. The peninsula is special because, by good fortune, much of the original forest was intact when the Predator Free campaign was launched in 2015. Through the foresight of numerous community volunteers, many bird habitats were being protected from invasive predators, particularly here on the Moeha mountain range. As a result of carbon tax of $5,000 a tonne, on top of a tourism entry level of $10,000 per person, long-haul air travel has become really expensive. The New Zealand tourism sector had to reinvent itself. Tourism numbers that were growing steadily at 10% per annum at the beginning of the millennium declined steeply. It saved the natural heritage of the country from being overrun by tourists, and it forced the tourism sector to shift from volume-based to being a value-based model. Now, New Zealand is one of the world's most expensive destinations. I point out Waiheke Island, which, more than 30 years ago, was one of the experimental projects to go predator-free on an island that had a lot of people on it. Back in 2019, the early pioneers of this movement had pretty clumsy tools like basic traps and bait stations. It's amazing that they were as effective as they were when you consider the innovations we've got today. Further along our journey today, we cross the Firth of Thames where I explain the amazing shift of rural land use. It's shifted away from this intensive dairy farming operation that created nitrate-rich sedimentation that smothered the marine environment of the Firth. Finally, at Coromandel, I stroll ashore to this ringing chorus of birdsong. 
It's called the Kiwi Cacophony, that trilling chorus of Kokako, Tui, Koromiko, among squads of shrieking kaka. And I'm drawn instantly to the words of Joseph Banks when in 1769 he came ashore in New Zealand and said, this melodious wild music is the best of anywhere in the world. So it's interesting to reflect on how this predator-free thing took off in New Zealand. Back at the turn of the century, people talked about this predator-free campaign as New Zealand's moonshot, comparing it to the words and ambitions of US President John F. Kennedy when he said he would put a man on the moon. It wasn't long before New Zealanders realised that the American moonshot cost $21 billion. And if New Zealand wanted to be taken seriously, it would either have to stop this boastful pretense or would have to make a serious financial investment. Because back in 2018, there were literally hundreds of native species on the endangered list. It was shameful. There was a lot of hand-wringing going on, but the decline of our biodiversity was relentless. One of the problems was the country had no way of measuring the decline of its biodiversity. Despite New Zealand's dependence on natural capital, productive soils, clean fresh water, and abundant marine ecosystems and the like, governments simply hadn't been interested in trying to quantify the value of it. Instead, they used a thing called GDP, or gross domestic product, to measure success. GDP relied on financial growth, but took no account of intergenerational sustainability. Finally, governments realised just how absurd the system was, and they had to balance financial growth with the importance of other pillars of capital, like social capital and human capital, and most important for the New Zealand economy, natural capital. Within a process called the wellbeing framework, the importance of preserving biodiversity was finally recognised, and the departments of conservation and the environment were finally on a par with ministries of health and social welfare. An experimental fund called Predator Free 2050, which was established in 2015, was designed to test the appetite for leveraging third-party funding for conservation. It was a brilliant return for the New Zealand taxpayer. The government's timid $30 million investment became $100 million within a few months, and this was used to pilot a whole range of predator management techniques throughout the country. A national science challenge had been established specifically to protect New Zealand's biological heritage. It was hell-bent on developing new techniques to eliminate invasive predators. There was going to be no silver bullet, so the challenge advanced on several fronts of research. For example, Thousands of solar-powered drones operating just above the canopy of the bush that could detect species-specific small mammals and infect them with a laser technology. Massive trap lines linked with sophisticated Wi-Fi technology. State-of-the-art acoustic and infrared beams that could traverse whole landscapes and prevent reinvasion of predators. And New Zealand invented some new gene drive technology that targeted rodents and earned billions of dollars in royalties as countries all around the world tried to reduce their rat populations. While these innovations were made possible by a highly supportive political and economic environment, the real heroes of the battle, then as now, were the army of volunteers all over the country 
led by organisations like Forest and Bird. These local groups used to waste a huge amount of time shuffling paper around, filing applications and reports. Now they're linked by a series of regional hubs that's overseen by a charitable trust, the Predator Free New Zealand Trust and regional councils that do all this paperwork for them. The volunteers are delighted because they're spending more time killing stoats or these days, of course, planting more trees. This made a huge difference to the morale and social cohesion of community conservation. People wanted to know that they were part of something big and were being maybe watched by the world. And of course they were. To save New Zealand's natural heritage from wide scale and almost certain extinction is being held up as one of the miracles of the modern world. So it's been a great trip to the Coromandel and it's reinforced my optimism despite all the challenges of climate change. And this predator-free New Zealand experiment shows you just how powerful community conservation can be when it clusters around a single cause. Hi everybody, my name is Izzy Fennick and Sir Rob Fennick was my father. You will have just watched a video of him, a video that I re-watched before I recorded this. It was pretty bittersweet to see him and hear him, to see and hear him so full of life and passion, talking about some of the things that he cared about most. course a predator-free New Zealand. He also talked about Waiheke, one of his other great passions and somewhere where we've lived for as long as I've been alive and where the seeds of dad's vision of a predator-free New Zealand were first sown at um, Te Matuku Peninsula. His love of nature prompted him to declare war on rampant pests 38 years ago but as always with dad he had a why stop there mentality let's do a moonshot and go for national eradication. Dad was very motivated by the fact that so many islands in the Hauraki Gulf were already, to, already predator free and that as their bird populations thrived, they would head off looking for new breeding grounds. Waiheke owed it to these brave adventurers to provide a safe landing and to perhaps be the first populated island in the world to be predator free. In the video you watch, Dad talks about some pioneers on Waiheke with their clumsy tools and basic traps and bait stations. Well, that property today with those low technology bait stations are doing some pretty amazing mahi and along with the game changing work of Te Kurawaia Waiheke and their stoat eradication program has resulted in an application for the translocation of Kiwi. First to Te Matuku and then hopefully the whole island will hear those haunting nightly kiwi calls. Save the Kiwi, Ngāti Paua and Naita Kitamaki are working through the application process with DOC and it will primarily hinge on the wider island community's commitment to responsible dog ownership, the single biggest threats to any kiwi anywhere. I know that Dad's passing was felt by many in the conservation movements here in Aotearoa but I also know that he can rest easy knowing he has inspired his family, then an island and finally a nation to love their native birds and create an army harnessed across Aotearoa to create safe habitat for them and all our other na native creatures. This week, I launched a new venture called Futureful, a recruitment platform that builds sustainability, climate change, conservation and social issues into its offering to organisations looking for passionate, productive and purpose-led talent. Dad once summed up the one thing he really tried to do with his life was to mainstream environmental responsibility. And that is exactly what I'm trying to do with Futureful and I know it's what many of you are trying to do with your mahi too. This is such an important legacy to leave for future generations of New Zealanders and I can tell you from first-hand experience that legacies can create generations of people 
committed to a cause. So thank you, Dad, for continuing to inspire us. Namahi nui. Kia ora, Izzy Benwick, Thank you for that update.